Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the uh, second BAF Summit. Uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Caroline Hill and uh, Caroline Malcolm. Uh, Caroline Hill is the uh, Director of Global Policy and Regulatory Strategy at Circle. And Caroline Pham uh, is uh, with the CFTC uh, in the United States um, and the Commissioner of the US Commodity Futures and Trading Commission. So. Um, Welcome both. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. Great. Lovely to meet you. Would you like to start? So, Karan, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Sure, sure. I would be happy to. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I first want to thank, of course, the British Blockchain Association uh, to speak. While I appreciate this opportunity to address you all virtually uh, from my home in Washington, DC, I hope that next year I can see many of you in person at next year's summit or perhaps at another event this year. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Caroline Hill. I'm the Director for Global Policy and Regulatory Strategy at Circle. As we all know, the advent of public blockchains and digital assets has reshaped how the global financial system operates, creating significant opportunities for disruption in the existing system. Today's financial industry can be transformed by digital assets and blockchain technology. The digital assets markets, however, have seen a turbulent year. Digital asset values have declined sharply and investors have incurred significant losses. Indeed, the concerns that animated the US study called the President's Working Group on Financial Markets Report on Stable Coins that focused on the potential systemic risk of stable coins have been partly vindicated by the speed with which crypto markets have unraveled. Reinforcing the message that complex systems fail in complex ways, we saw the death spiral and failure of an algorithmic digital token, which called itself a stablecoin, but was in fact not. However, corrections and retracements are natural and healthy occurrence in innovative, fast growth industries. In fact, Bank of England Deputy Governor Cunliffe remarked recently that this time period will separate companies that can weather the winter from those that cannot. And we agree. It also underscores the value of the regulated, fully reserved and transparent model that has helped maintain the stability of the stablecoin USDC in the face of market volatility. Circle is the sole issuer of USDC, one of the world's largest digital currencies with over 51 billion in circulation. During this time of market volatility, we have seen what we consider a flight to safety by consumers, steadily increasing USDC's market capitalization. It is critical that stablecoins in the future are well-managed and well-regulated. To describe what this looks like, we have issued policy principles that reflect Circle's real-world experience, experience operating USDC. We believe that any regulatory framework should encompass these aspects. First, and fundamentally, the use of money should be free, irrespective of its form factor, when used in a lawful manner consistent with democratic values. A stablecoin should be a digital bearer instrument entitling the holder to redemption at par for one unit of fiat currency, even in the event of the issuer's bankruptcy. Furthermore, as digital bearer instruments, stablecoins should at all times remain backed one-to-one -one by equivalent high-quality liquid assets in the care, custody, and control of well-regulated financial institutions and banks in a bankruptcy remote manner. Regulations designed to implement the Regulations designed to mandate the implementation of safety, soundness, and risk-adjusted prudential standards should be adopted, including as it relates to asset composition, maturity, weighting, liquidity, and custody. Issuers should also have transparent risk disclosures in order to bolster market trust and consumer protection. Circle has also found that when backed by fiat, stablecoins are responsive to monetary policy and its transmission, which supports financial stability objectives in a country. I want to spend a little bit more time on what we see as the importance of transparent and fully backed reserves for fiat backed stable coins, given the recent market instability. These events have demonstrated several times with the full force of the capital markets, the importance of strong risk management and ample liquidity in order to help protect consumers and build ecosystem trust. If you want to reference the dollar, for example, and create price parity, you actually need to hold high quality liquid assets that are backed by the dollar and inside the regulated banking system. This is step one in avoiding the risk of breaking the peg and potential death spirals as we have seen that occur in real time. 
Without addressing the risks within the digital asset industry, we will never realize the potential breakthrough innovation of the underlying payment rails. And as countries begin to take action to foster responsible innovation, companies without the same desire to be regulated will look for jurisdictions with lax regulation, oversight, and supervision. These companies pose a threat to consumers around the world and are unfairly competing with companies who are operating within its regulatory perimeter. Ultimately, consumers should not be collateral for companies playing regulatory arbitrage. Indeed, as was demonstrated with the collapse of the Terra, unregulated companies can hurt the average consumers. Well-regulated countries must play a strong leadership role in setting international standards for prudential and AML regulations. Many countries are currently considering a variety of regulatory frameworks for stable coins, but material different requirements from one country to another will significantly increase the cost of compliance to a nascent industry and possibly open the door to a race to the bottom situation. Circle commends the work that the Financial Stability Board has done in coordination with G20 countries to develop these prudential regulatory standards. The US dollar has naturally experienced a first mover advantage in the stablecoin space. Even though the crypto economy is global, 99% of payment stablecoins are dollar de denominated. Now these same benefits could accrue to other countries and jurisdictions like the UK and EU if more stablecoin supply was denominated in pounds or euros. Circle has expanded its portfolio of fully reserved fiat-backed stablecoins and launched Eurocoin in June of this year. Eurocoin and any additional future fiat-backed stablecoins that we launch will continue to build on the trust, transparency, accountability, and pro-regulation approach that has made USDC one of the largest digital assets in circulation today. Policy and lawmakers in the US have introduced or called for legislation that would create a bespoke regulatory model for the issuance of payment stable coins. Treasury Secretary Yellen recently convened a special session of the Financial Stability Oversight Council to underscore the urgent need to regulate stable coins. Several bills have been introduced in Congress and frameworks include the creation of a new federal license for payment stable coins bringing registered issuers under the supervision and regulation of federal financial regulators. Leading U.S. policymakers have recognized the unique benefits and risks of payment stable coins in the U.S. economy and are therefore making an active effort to establish a sensible federal framework. In the U.K., the Financial Services Markets Bill, currently working its way through committee and parliament, provides for the use of payment stable coins for day-to-day -day payments. Following the announcement from the government in April, the UK is actively assessing how stable coins and other digital assets can unlock opportunities for British businesses and consumers and strengthen UK's global competitiveness. The window of opportunity is now for the UK to maintain its position as a leading jurisdiction for global finance and innovation. However, the mixed messages from regulators and apparent misalignment between the government and regulators impedes progress towards a stable business environment in which digital asset firms can make a long-term investment. The UK should regulate digital assets in a holistic, balanced, and technology-neutral manner. The government should thoroughly evaluate the differences between blockchain-based payment systems and traditional interbank payment systems prior to establishing a regulatory regime. Circle has publicly encouraged the UK government to establish a bespoke regulatory and oversight framework for systemic digital settlement asset firms and for fully reserved digital currency issuers to be subject to sound prudential regulation. A novel supervisory framework would likely be the best way to recognize the diversity of digital asset firms, their operations, and sufficiently regulate those firms. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not touch upon the future of crypto assets in the EU, the third largest economic zone in the world. While no comprehensive body of rules is perfect, especially not one as far reaching as Mika, it nonetheless provides practical solution to issues that other jurisdictions are beginning to grapple with. Namely, a harmonized comprehensive framework across an entire region that gives market participants regulatory clarity and crypto end users key protections and market wide assurances. Mika, Mika may on the surface seem onerous, but deeper down, it offers a pathway for Europe to emerge as a competitive region, the safe, sound development of digital assets ecosystem. 
For one, conforming with the existing e-money frameworks, as well as clear crypto asset token classifications, sets the stage for broad broader market adoption across Europe. Licensing passport rights and the avoidance of the harmful race to the bottom of regulatory arbitrage are a net benefit for companies and consumers. All of this will improve Europe's attractiveness to companies and individuals. Circle, for instance, plans to continue to invest and grow its presence in Europe to help build this responsible, Mika-conforming crypto asset economy. The UK should review Mika carefully. There are areas in which the UK should harmonize its standards with those of Mika. For instance, standards for certain types of digital asset activities such as custody. However, there are also opportunities for UK leadership to capitalize on the regulatory fle flexibility afforded post-Brexit. For example, in the areas of unnecessary capital buffer requirements for fully reserved and stable coins, issuers, and transaction fees. These misguided regulations will only serve to limit, limit consumer optionality and cut off Europe from the global flow of digital asset liquidity and stability, and they should not be repeated in the UK. Finally, I wanted to briefly touch on uh, a popular issue in the industry right now, which is privacy, given the tornado cash sanctions recently imposed by the US Treasury. Some may wrongly believe that the privacy that users are afforded when using digital assets is incompatible with financial institutions' compliance obligations. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Novel cryptographic primitives such as zero-knowledge proofs have the potential to enhance privacy by proving a relevant piece of information. For example, that a user is not a sanctioned individual without revealing additional sensitive information. For example, Circle is a launch partner and key contributor to Garrity, a set of decentralized identity standards launched in February 2022 and developed with support from Block, Coinbase, and other leading blockchain projects. Verity enables organizations to issue and verify digital identity credentials for users. These credentials are owned by the user, allowing total control over when and how identity attestations are accessed by different organizations or protocols. These innovations may also protect against discrimi discrimination and identity theft, making access to financial services more accessible and equitable. As I've discussed here today, the technology of blockchains and open protocols for value exchange are not standing still. And whatever the ultimate policy and regulatory outcomes, it is crucial that policy embraces and enables the development of this internet of value. Policy frameworks need to support an open and competitive playing field and allow new technologies to flourish. Part of that journey is a necessary aspect of education and information. So again, I wanna thank our host today for an opportunity to speak and allowing me to share Circle, Circle's views on the regulatory global frameworks. Caroline Hill, thank you very much. Uh, again, great to get the view from, uh, uh, from the private sector and uh, uh, a global view uh, at, at that. Um, I would now like to, I think, reintroduce Caroline Malcolm, who is head of international policy at Chain Analysis. Yeah, apologies for that earlier. Um, uh, Caroline Malcolm is a senior poly, uh, public policy leader focused on the tech and finance centers, obviously in this particular relationship, uh, thinking about uh, cryptocurrencies. Hi, Caroline, how are you? Good, thanks, Brian. It's great to be with you. Great pleasure. Um, off to you. Great, thank you. And uh, thanks very much for the invitation to, to be here. It's a very impressive uh, way I think you've brought together all the blockchain um, associations. It's often very difficult. This is, I often say this industry is already 13 years old and at the same time it's only 13 years old so kind of bringing together these different groups is, is definitely a challenge but I think a very worthwhile thing to do because as I want to talk about today although we see um, lots of different uh, legislation popping up uh, across the globe and, and Caroline Hill from Circle has just done a great job of, of giving some of us examples of some of the key um, key legislations that we've seen and also that we might see coming up uh, over the coming six to 12 months, I think there are some, some common themes. So I think as blockchain associations working with industry and also with governments, which are partners to the you know, safe and sustainable development of this industry, um, really understanding what those points of commonality, as well as thinking about some of the differences between the sort of regulatory regimes that are being developed are actually really, really important. So when I was thinking about, you know, uh, about this conversation, I sort of thought, well, you know, what 
what I call this this speech if I if I gave it a title, and I really think it's sort of crypto policy, the teenage years, because we are very much at a very kind of important tricky um, moment of, of transition in, in the policy and regulatory world when it comes to crypto and the broader digital assets space. And that makes it very exciting if you're on the policy side of things um, and, and probably can make it uh, frustrating um, and exciting in parts too uh, if you're thinking about, you know, what to build and, and, and looking to the future of, of this space. But I wanted to uh, spend the time today really thinking about what are some of those common themes that, that we're seeing, perhaps highlighting a couple of different approaches approaches that we've seen countries take, but really focus on those areas of, of commonality. Because when I when I do look across the landscape um, internationally, I think there's really sort of five or six areas where we see countries moving to put rules in place or adapt existing rules for the world of, of, of crypto. Um, and, and I think they provide us with some important lessons for what we might expect to see in, in jurisdictions which perhaps haven't yet taken action, um, who might be thinking about it. And, you know, it's often that that uncertainty uh, that I think Caroline Hill just spoke about, you know, although, you know, Mike, you know, may be considered to have its shortcomings in some regard, one of the most important things it does is provide regulatory clarity. Um, and that, that, that can't be, I think, understated in terms of how valuable that is in terms of understanding, you know, the, allowing the industry to finally make some, some investments and really begin to grow in that, in that part of the world. But stepping back, as I said, from individual country examples, I think there's a couple of things that I just want to highlight. Perhaps I'll just sort of start by listing them out and then coming back and thinking about them all. Uh, a little bit more in detail. One is around um, anti-money laundering, you know, countering the financing of terrorism. No surprises there. Um, I think everybody is, you know, very well understand this is really one of the first areas that was tackled from a regulatory perspective when it comes to digital assets. Um, and it continues to be something. If we think about the fact that, you know, the standard was first developed by the Financial Action Task Force in, in 2019 with some updated um, important guidance in 2021, Notwithstanding that, it's something that the FATF has been thinking about and working about on since about 2014, 2015. And so getting to that point, you can see there just kind of what sort of trajectory, um, you know, and how much time it takes really to move from that kind of ideation phase of, of regulation through to actually, you know, establishing a standard and allowing countries to move into implementation. So that's certainly one, and it's got implications for countries, it's got implications for, for the industry as well. The second I would really say is consumer protection. And to date, uh, there's been a lot of focus in particular with regards to advertising and, and promotion um, of, you know, crypto assets and crypto asset services. But I think increasingly what we're going to see, and, and again, hints of this in, in MICA uh, in particular, which is probably one of the most advanced regimes, which is around product disclosures as well. So moving, you know, sort of the first step in consumer protection has historically been advertising and promotion rules, who you can advertise what you can advertise uh, to them. And secondly, I think we're beginning to see more and more product disclosure requirements. And I think if we look out the next six to 12 months, that will, that's what we can expect to see even more of uh, over that time frame. The third one uh, is really market conduct and integrity. So they're, they're you know, we're really talking about things like market manipulation, whether that be insider trading, whether that be front running, um, different forms of uh, wash trading, for example. So there's different forms of, of market abuse. A lot of these concepts we're very familiar with from the traditional financial space, but we really haven't necessarily seen specific rules in that in when it comes to crypto in this space. Now, Often governments will say, you know, our existing rules apply into this space just as they do for, you know, the traditional financial system. Um, but but we're really yet to see some very concrete guidance on how that transition and, and the application of those rules into crypto. Again, uh, there are a few exceptions to that. We've seen some interesting principles on this issue of market conduct come out from Gibraltar earlier this year. We've seen some rules from uh, Abu Dhabi Global Markets. And of course, again, um, MICA has some rules relating to, to market conduct as well. 
Um, we've also obviously seen some still relatively isolated but but quite important prosecutions take place from you know market manipulations, uh, particularly in the US market. And I, as I said, that's an area where I think we can expect to see regulators pay a lot more attention going forward. The fourth issue is really around uh, financial stability and market oversight. So that really macro level view of what's actually going on in, in this sector. And I think trying to look at two things in, in particular. Um, and, and Caroline Hill referenced some of the you know, recent uh, market turbulence, and that is really focused Minds and we, but we really saw the first shift, I think, from the policymakers' perspective on this back in February this year. So, before a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about market turbulence, Terra Luna, for example, or Three O's Capital, um, even before those events took place, governments had really started to pay a lot more attention to that macro picture. And that we could see reflected uh, in the report G20 from the Financial Stability Board in, in February this year, which really marked a very important shift in tone. Up until this point, crypto assets, uh, the crypto asset ecosystem is something that the FSB has been monitoring for, for five or six years now very closely. Um, and up until then, it's really been a case of, you know, this is still a relatively small industry. Um, it, it is developing, but really nothing too much to see here. There's, you know, the sort of things like contagion risk, for example, is nothing we have to worry about too much. That's until we get to February this year. And then we see the FSB really show a marked change in tone. I think if people haven't noticed that, it's something they should be paying more attention to, which is really when they turned around and said, this industry is growing. Two things are happening in particular. One, the complexity within the industry is growing. And secondly, the intersections between this industry and the traditional financial uh, sector. And secondly, the intersections between this industry and the real economy are growing. And as those uh, intersections grow, the contagion risk of something that might happen in the crypto space spilling over into some of these broader financial systems or the real economy are, are increasing and that's something that we need to get a better understanding of the data on and begin to think a little bit more about what are some of perhaps the, the guardrails that we could put in place to be able to prevent those, those spillover impacts should something um, you know, of quite significant magnitude happen in the, in the crypto ecosystem. And so that is something where we've seen a growing demand for data to understand you know, that macro picture of what's going on at, you know, at the global level, but also at individual country levels in terms of how, you know, what's actually happening in any particular country. You know, where are the big holders of stable coins, for example? Where are the, um, you know, where where are the flows of, you know, cryptos going between? Trying to really understand that picture and, and how this ecosystem works at a much more uh, detailed level is something that's only going to, to increase. And I think when we see uh, the next uh, report to the G20 in October this year, we can expect to see, you know, a, a greater analysis of this issue. And I think it's going to probably have some flow and impacts in terms of how governments are thinking about regulation. So two things I'd watch out for there is, is the February report. If you haven't had a look at it, it's probably worth having a look at and, and keep an eye out for the one in October as well. There's just some early signalling about what we might expect from, from government. These are things that are happening at that supranational level. So that it's more about uh, guidance or recommendations to countries, but those do filter down, as we've seen with the FATF recommendations, for example, they do filter down to the national level. Um, and, and so getting that kind of advance notice about where, you know, the policy uh, may be developing is, is really important. The next one, which I think is often gets um, sort of quite short, short thrift, uh, is, is, is tax, actually. And I think when people think about tax and digital assets, often the focus is on what's the tax treatment of digital assets. You know, what do I do with my gains and losses, for example? Can I offset them against, you know, uh, diff, you know gains in other, in other asset classes? That, and that's certainly very important. I think there is an even more foundationally important piece that is coming, though, and that's the crypto asset reporting framework that's being developed by the OECD. This is very similar for those of you who come from the traditional finance space. You'll be familiar probably with FATCA. Um, 
the foreign account uh, reporting requirements from the US and the common reporting standard, which is the international standard for um, reporting of uh, foreign account holdings by tax administrations. Essentially, those same rules are coming to the crypto space. And so what that really means is that crypto exchanges, crypto asset service providers, and that's, again, this question of who's within that group, and that's going to be a separate definition from the FATF de definition, so important to understand who's actually caught by that. But these crypto asset service providers are going to be required to report information to their local tax administration about the holdings of their clients, and that information will be shared between tax authorities all over the world. So this is really a huge step forward in terms of reporting and disclosure requirements uh, on exchanges, on people like custodians and brokers, in terms of you know this sort of information that will be made, made available to, to tax authorities. And that means not only do they have to make it available, but they have to make sure that they have that information up to date at the moment. So that's really one to, I think, watch out for. We're expecting to see the OECD finalise um, that at a, uh, the guidance on that uh, later this year, hopefully by October, but obviously there's still a few more details to, to be ironed out. Um, but, uh, and then countries will have about 18 months to actually implement it from there. So it's not necessarily something for tomorrow, but it is certainly something that is that is coming. And if you are in that, in that group of, you know, crypto asset service providers, there are going to be some very clear new opportunities obligations on you in that regard, but something to, to keep an eye on uh, there as well. Two of the things I actually really want to mention, which perhaps a little bit more niche in some ways, because we're not seeing them perhaps widespread so far, but I, I, I suspect they're not very far behind, so important to keep in mind. One of those is around sustainability and ESG. And we know, um, again, taking Europe as the example here, there's a lot of discussion as MICA was being developed and we should say, of course, that Microis isn't quite yet finalised. Uh, we, we, we're hopefully getting close, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but one of the, the key issues in, in Microis development was how to deal with sort of environment and climate concerns. And of course, uh, earlier this year, the, the industry really focused on the proposal for a proof ban on, on proof of work consensus mechanisms, for example. That idea was ultimately scrapped. And at one point, I think we thought that, you know, uh, these issues would be dealt with under a review of the Sustainable Finance uh, EU taxonomy uh, in 2023. I think where we're ending up, though, is that we will see some requirements for environmental and climate impact disclosures. So, again, more reporting requirements. And those are going to sit not just with the issuers of tokens, but also on uh, the crypto asset service providers again. So there is going to be a significant step up in terms of the reporting obligations of crypto asset service providers. And although, obviously, uh, when it comes to MICA, that's very focused on players in the European market, the implications of that are really going to, to be global. And I wouldn't be surprised to see those sorts of uh, environmental disclosure requirements take, um, you know, gain attention in other parts of the world as well. The final piece, perhaps, um, which, again, uh, I think probably hasn't had the attention that it that might have is the new prudential requirements for financial institutions when it comes to their exposures to, to crypto assets. Uh, the BCBS, part of the Bank for International Settlements, has issued some new guidance on this uh, earlier, earlier this year in, in June or July um, and is actually closing their public consultation on this at the end of the month. So this is really, it's not about stablecoin issuers, it's about traditional financial institutions, but I think it also gives some good hints about what might be expected from stablecoin issuers themselves in the future. And it really is about putting um, an understanding of, of how the BIS views risk when it comes to crypto assets, whether it be about stable coins in particular, or whether it be about crypto assets more generally. So how they view risk uh, when it comes to this thing and some of the limits that they're going to be putting on traditional financial institutions. So again, that's that supranational piece. We will then see countries move to actually um, implement those rules at the, at the national level. Um, and we do expect that guidance to be finalised by uh, the BIS in January 2023. So not very far away. And as I said, I think it's going to have some important implications for the, the structure 
uh, of the industry and, and give some good hints about what we might expect in terms of requirements on stablecoin issuers uh, going forward. Um, I know we're close to time, Brian. So I think perhaps the, the the main takeaway here is you know there are these there are these common themes uh, that we're seeing different jurisdictions tackle and I think it's really important to you know although we often tend to focus on a particular jurisdiction that we might be working in is really to look across the globe and understand that many different countries are trying to tackle the same issues and I tried to set out there some of those key points of, of commonality and really try and draw from the the best you know uh, examples particularly from the perspective of blockchain associations really try to think about it not just as an advocacy effort about you know any one particular country but really drawing on that that global expertise that has been developed uh, no, the, the, the supranational um, approach is clearly a very very interesting and and, and a relatively new um, aspect of, yes. of um, any any sort of crypto asset at the moment so uh, thank you very much really appreciate that coming uh, so we will finish there. The next session's in three minutes. <laughs> uh, so we will see you back uh, in a bit. Thank you very much. Bye.